So, here's a question. Why are there no games about making music? Now, I know what you're thinking, there are loads of games about making music out there, and it's actually a very popular topic. To which I would respond, are you sure? The Legend of Zelda might see you playing a whole assortment of musical instruments, from the ocarina, to a harp, to a wolf, but they never really graduate beyond a gimmick. In Zelda Blade 3, you might be constantly tooting on your little flute, and the symbology of playing it might be a major thematic touchstone, but you don't really have any control over when or how you play it. And Brutal Legend is a game with metal music specifically at the core of its identity, but it's actually just kind of a standard third-person brawler that awkwardly becomes Pikmin midway through. The musical element is purely thematic. So what about games specifically designed around music? Well, rhythm titles like BPM Bullets Per Minute, Metal Hellsinger, and Hi-Fi Rush are intrinsically connected to music, but no matter how much effort these games put into making you think you're the one creating the songs, you're really only ever moving to them. They're ultimately less music games and more, uh, dancing games. Even the most directly musical games of all still fail to let you make music for yourself. Stuff like Guitar Hero or the wonderfully silly Trombone Champ let you play instruments, but you never get to play your own compositions or express yourself musically. You just have to play along to a song that somebody else wrote, and if you don't, you get punished. That's all a very long-winded way of saying that while there are loads of video games about music, there are very few, almost none, where the focus is actually on making or composing music for yourself. And music isn't alone here. In fact, this weird aversion to giving players any sort of creative power for themselves is the same for other forms of artistic expression too. Cooking games are very rarely about anything other than rigidly following a recipe by the books, but as any cooking fan knows that experimentation and coming up with your own recipes is all part of the fun. Photography games usually aren't concerned with striking angles or artful framing, and more often than not, will penalise you for doing anything other than snapping pictures of a single thing in centre frame. Even games about writing stories, like the otherwise great Storyteller, really hit the nail on the head by not asking you to come up with your own tales, but instead assemble a set of pre-made pieces in exactly the right order. It makes for a fun puzzle game, but uh, not exactly a particularly satisfying writing endeavour. Video games have an interesting relationship with creativity, don't they? On one hand, games are unique among all artistic mediums in being able to present us with interactive worlds filled with tools for creative self-expression. On the other though, there are very few games out there that manage to make creativity not just fun, but actually feel worthwhile, to the point that many developers simply don't bother trying and just pay lip service to the idea instead. But why is this? What makes creative fun so uniquely difficult to get right? Because it seems from an outside perspective, like video games and freeform self-expression ought to be a natural fit. Unfortunately, the truth is a little bit more complex than that. Simply put, creativity is a hard thing to make work in games because creative works are an inherently difficult thing to judge. The abstract, multifaceted, and crucially subjective nature of all art means that it's impossible to really break down the product of creativity into discrete variables, which, as you might imagine, makes using them as the cornerstone of a video game a little bit tricky. While a game can count the number of different notes you played, how well you stayed on the beat, and even if you played any recognisable patterns, it can't tell you whether a song is sufficiently jazzy, or even whether you succeeded in making a good one. Because that kind of judgement is simply outside the realms of maths and objectivity that video games operate in. What this means is that it's difficult for games to encourage us to be creative, make our work feel worthwhile, or reward us for expressing ourselves at all, without tying our creativity to more concrete gameplay systems that can be objectively judged. Statistics, accuracy measurements, resource management, stuff like that. However, in doing so, games often end up undermining the very creativity they'd sought to encourage. Nowhere is this more clear than in the infamous case of Spore. It's got a very powerful creature creation engine, but because most parts are just strictly better or worse than others, you have no real reason to actually make something cool. I mean, there's literally no reason for you to make a creature with more than two legs, for example. That's just wasted points right there. The fundamental challenge faced by all games that want to be about creativity is in getting the abstract freeform stuff that makes composing music, or writing, or drawing pictures of Waluigi's feet, I mean regular drawings so fun, to play nice with the more concrete structure, rules, and obstacles that we expect out of a video game. It's a tricky problem to solve, and if I'm honest, I don't think any games have really 100% managed to get the balance right. But among all the various tactics developers have tried over the years, I think that there's one constant that makes the best ones stand out. The key, I think, isn't trying to insulate creative and mechanical gameplay systems from each other, because at that point you may as well just have Doom open in one window and MS Paint open in the other, but instead to use the respective strengths of each style of gameplay to enhance and enrich the other. 
More traditional gameplay mechanics and objectives can endow creative spaces with a sense of purpose and progression that they often lack, whereas an emphasis on player freedom and expression can endow otherwise stale gameplay with a sense of personal meaning and empowerment. When done well, games can have creativity and objectivity working in more or less perfect harmony, each one supporting the other. Sounds pretty good, right? Unfortunately, this is easier said than done. There are multiple obstacles standing in the way of games achieving this hypothetical balance. One of the biggest hurdles for any creative game to overcome, for example, is to actually get people to be creative in the first place. There are few things more demoralising than staring at a blank piece of paper and being told not only to make something beautiful from scratch, but to somehow force yourself to be inspired. And a trap that many artistically oriented games fall into is in not giving players enough encouragement and inspiration to get stuck in, particularly when other gameplay elements have much more visible incentives. Look at Minecraft for example, which makes a huge deal about being virtual Lego and handing players the tools they need to make cool buildings, but in spite of that, constructing stuff in Minecraft is kind of a chore, and the game does, honestly, a terrible job at actually encouraging you to build things. Whenever I play Minecraft, I have to really force myself to advance beyond a boring wooden shack because this right here already meets all my gameplay needs. It's got storage, furnaces, it protects me from monsters, it's the complete package. But it's also incredibly creatively boring. If there were some sort of reason to build more than a featureless storage cube, I might be encouraged to actually care about the buildings I make, but unfortunately, no such incentive exists. It doesn't help matters that all the coolest materials in Minecraft that might inspire you to make an interesting structure or automated system are usually locked behind massive resource grinds. I'd love to make a building using copper one of these days, but mining enough of it for it to be useful takes absolutely forever, and that's not even taking into account weathering. Minecraft's not alone here either. This is also true for other survival games as well, particularly ones that lean more heavily into the survival side of things. Why would you spend precious resources that could be used on food, weapons, or transport on pointless cosmetic stuff? The simple answer is that you wouldn't, and many people, myself included, often find ourselves avoiding engaging with creative mechanics in these games because they're working across purposes with the rest of the experience, even though they might really be quite fun. Terraria is one of the few games of this ilk that I think gets things right, because it forces you to build stuff and get creative if you want NPCs to move in, all of whom offer helpful bonuses that you're actively invested in acquiring, like cheap heals, reforging, anti-corruption tools, and a bunch of other stuff. In order to get the merchant, or nurse, or this dude to turn up, you need to build them a house. It needs to be a certain size, it needs to be lit, it needs a back wall, and it needs a table and chair. And what this means is that even the most progression-minded player is all but forced to build a little village for all their new friends to live in that organically expands the further through the game you get, introducing a fun little creative task that fits naturally into the world and into the progression system. It also helps that Terraria makes building very easy, and nice-looking construction materials are very plentiful, meaning that the temptation to build a boring, efficient skyscraper like the one I have here is mitigated to a certain extent. It is worth mentioning, though, that this kind of encouragement doesn't have to be forced and integral to progression in order for creativity to flourish. Sometimes, simply giving players a gap to fill and an excuse to be creative is enough to get them to stop and mess around for a bit, hopefully serving as a nice break from more involved gameplay. The games of Greg Lobanov and Wishes Unlimited, creators of the excellent Wonder Song and Chicory A Colourful Tale, know this all too well, cleverly designing these games' primary gimmicks, singing and painting, to be usable not just in puzzles, but all the time, even when they don't actually do anything of consequence. Because these abilities are so flexible and feel so good to use, you'll constantly catch yourself messing around or doodling as you run about on the main quest, allowing you to gain that all-important feeling of self-expression without requiring you to sit down and create a masterpiece from scratch every time. Relatedly, some of the best creative games out there leverage the sense of direction and progress afforded to more traditional game design in order to not just give players prompts that they can be inspired by, but also to feel as if there's a contiguous journey connecting their various creative endeavours. Passper 2 2, the sequel to Passper 2 the Starving Artist, and something that should really be called Passper 2 with the number 2 in the name like a naughty's movie poster, really improves on its predecessor by doing just that. Rather than an infinite series of blank canvases, the game follows a semi-open-ended chain of quests depicting your rise up the art world, starting with you painting warning signs about evil fish and ending with you painting celebrated masterworks, with you unlocking new areas, meeting new NPCs, and being given new things to paint along the way. Even this surface level of connectivity and context between paintings helps to give each one its own feel and serves to excellently break up what would otherwise be boring repetition, boring repetition, boring repetition, boring repetition even if you're more or less doing the same thing with each and every painting. Now, 
Something else interesting that Passpa 2 does is that it doesn't start you off with the full complement of brushes, colours and equipment that most other painting games would normally give you right away. Instead, you have to earn money by selling paintings to buy them yourself. In so doing, not just encouraging you to paint, but making progress and creativity one and the same. This blending of creative and progression-based goals solves another key problem that creative games often run into, and that's how to make the effort you put into the stuff you make feel worthwhile. A big problem with creative working games is that while it can be very satisfying to think about, it often lacks the immediate feedback and satisfaction of more straightforward activities and approaches. Spending an hour figuring out an elaborate solution to a Hitman level, for example, is all well and good, but when you can get more or less the same result by walking up to someone and popping them in the head with your silenced pistol, it's hard not to feel like your effort was a little bit pointless. Games that try to balance creativity with more concrete gameplay in this way are fighting a perpetual battle against our worst instincts. Because we players are constantly getting better at a given game, and more often than not, directly getting more powerful as well, it becomes gradually harder and harder to justify spending time and effort being creative when an existing strategy, or simply a brute force approach, would work just as well, if not better. Prey, I felt, really fell into this trap. Early on in the game, creativity is king, and you can use the glue gun and the transforming power to skip ahead and find cool ways to deal with enemies. But by the end game, almost nothing really poses a threat to you, and so you can just shotgun or magic blast your way through every enemy in the game, making all those cool lateral thinking approaches more or less obsolete as the game goes on. In order to keep a creative approach feeling like it matters and is worth the player's time to attempt, many games constantly change and update your toolset to ensure that you can't simply bypass having to come up with interesting solutions to problems by virtue of experience. In Trailmakers, a copyright compliant game about making cars out of blocks, the game starts you off with very few parts and makes you collect more in a way that's constantly expanding what kind of vehicles you can make and what kind of terrain you can successfully navigate, meaning you have to keep creating all new vehicles to deal with swamps or bits that require flight or underwater segments, almost like an engineering-centric metroidvania. Similarly, logistics games like factory games or city builders mark progress by giving you new systems to play with, usually requiring refits of your existing infrastructure. New transport methods or processing buildings each present a new challenge that should require a brand new approach to the design of your base, keeping creativity feeling relevant. Of course, eventually, all games will run out of new tools and gimmicks to keep throwing at us, and the dominance of systems mastery will eventually reassert itself. Card games and RPGs, for example, provide fantastic creative playgrounds as your tool belt fills up with more and more options to synergize and experiment with, but not forever. As you learn to master these strategies and mechanics, which options are good and which ones are bad will become steadily more apparent, and it becomes ever harder to justify picking novel, creative strategies that are kind of janky over proven techniques you know will work. Sure, a deck built around strike cards, and in particular perfect strike in Slay the Spire, is an interesting idea, but most experienced players know that it's a terrible card and a terrible strategy and is never worth doing. Equally, it's easy to look at the talent trees and character options in an RPG right as you're starting out and see a canvas of infinite opportunity, but once you're at the end game, you'll feel an overwhelming pressure to use the agreed upon best options because why wouldn't you? Ultimately winning is all that matters, creativity will always be secondary. Another approach to trying to preserve the fun of experimentation and inventiveness is to simply twist the balance of a game such that novel creative solutions are themselves optimal. Tears of the Kingdom is great here. A large part of the game sees you building little Zonai cars out of the parts you collect as you play, and you'll quickly figure out a few efficient vehicles that you can make using as few parts as possible whenever you need them. Ordinarily, this would massively reduce your opportunities for creativity as you progress through the game. But Tears of the Kingdom cleverly manages to mitigate this by placing a bunch of random machine bits in places where you'd think to build one, next to wide plains, canyons, on sky islands, you get the picture, they're basically everywhere. What this means is that trying to create something out of these random collections of free parts is not just more fun from a creative point of view than just making the same hoverbike again, it's also technically more efficient because it doesn't consume any of your inventory of Zonai devices, giving us the best of both worlds. Alas, not even Nintendo can fix all the problems of integrating creativity into more typical game design. Because whilst improvising cool cars feels very satisfying and isn't burdened by the guilt of inefficiency, you're still being forced to play within the limits of optimization and practicality. There are so many cool ways to push the Tears of the Kingdom engine to its limits in inefficient, impractical, and downright silly ways that are loads of fun and require an intimate understanding of the mechanics, but that the game simply has no capacity to really reward. Making these cool interpretations feel like they're less important and less worthwhile than experiencing the game within the boundaries of optimal play. Many titles ultimately have this shortcoming. 
where's the reward for making a cool looking character in an RPG, or beating Half-Life 2 with just a pistol, or creating a mega incestuous dynasty in Crusader Kings? They don't really exist, even though these interesting creative endeavours require just as much thought and present just as much of a challenge as playing these games properly. This isn't the fault of developers, of course, but it does highlight the inescapable fact that video games are inherently limited when it comes to what extent they can interface with human creativity. So, is that it? Is there no kind of game that's capable of effectively paying off creative work? Well, I'm happy to report that there is, and in fact there are quite a lot of them, they're just not a type of game that you'd ordinarily consider as rewarding creativity. Let's circle up around to fighting games, because they are a great example of what I'm obliquely hinting at here. The key to success in a competitive fighting game isn't just knowing the moves and when to use them, but being able to surprise your opponents, mix up familiar combos, and exploit their mental state in order to gain the upper hand. Players that can think in an abstract way to break past their foes' defences and keep them guessing are much more likely to win over those who robotically and unimaginatively repeat the same easy-to-predict combos over and over. In other words, victory in a fighting game requires a hell of a lot of creativity. And creativity is only the deciding factor because your actions aren't being judged and responded to by an algorithm, but a flawed, messy human brain. In fact, all competitive games are great at rewarding creativity in this way, from real-time strategy games that see you using feints, rushes, and surprise attacks, to card games that contain layer upon layer of bluffing and prediction as a core part of their identity. This stuff is only relevant against human opponents because we can imagine possibilities and interpret abstract data in a way that computers simply can't. Of course, it's not just competitive multiplayer games that reward creativity. Look at stuff like speedrunning or high score chasing. Victory in these titles isn't determined by the games themselves, but the comparison of your efforts to yourself or other people, removing the upper limit on creativity that most games have. Stuff like spectacle fighters use scores and medals to get you to really mix up your moves and dance around enemies instead of relying upon safe, efficient strategies. And problem solvers like the Zactronics games force you to imagine new techniques and creatively manipulate their systems in order to shave off precious cycles and space. Speedrunning is the purest expression of this idea though, turning regular games into an entirely player-driven competition that often goes beyond the original design vision of the game. The necessity of abstract application of game mechanics and route planning optimization skills makes for incredibly fertile creative ground, and that's not even considering stuff like glitches and out-of-bounds discoveries, all of which turn the game inside out in ways that no one but a human could possibly appreciate or judge. That's kind of the solution to the digital creativity problem. Games are never going to be a substitute for a pair of human eyes or ears when it comes to judging creativity. And luckily, they don't have to be. Everything from the Jackbox games, which are little more than gamified joke telling, to level editors that let you create nonsense that would never fit into a commercial title, only work because video game systems are taking a back seat and are instead working to empower human creativity rather than restrict it. Even the creation of actual digital art is enriched by this supportive relationship between mechanics and people. The ability of Final Fantasy XIV's bard class to play music is more than a virtual instrument, it's a key element of a role-playing metagame. And Occupy White Walls' virtual art galleries are enriched by video game systems as well, forcing you to start small and gradually expand your art gallery in a way that rewards you for drawing in new visitors. It's also worth mentioning the social media game of showing off your video game creations in order to grab as many precious likes as possible, but that's uh, kind of a topic onto itself. And of course, as you might have already figured out, this whole human-centric evaluation of creativity also works on a much more individual scale. In real life, if you create something cool, whether it's a simple drawing or, I don't know, an entire video game and never show it to anyone, it still has value because you got to appreciate it as both audience and creator. The structure of most video games encourages us to seek external validation and reward for everything, but with creative play, we don't really need it. So long as your creative process was satisfying, fulfilling, or at least fun, then it shouldn't matter that the thing you did was pointless or even directly self-destructive, its value is still self-evident. Artistry has never been a particularly efficient or productive endeavour, and so by expecting video games to somehow make it so, we often lose sight of why artistic expression really matters. It's not about the reward or even being celebrated as a master of your craft, but engaging in a natural human instinct to create, doing something that feels worthwhile for its own sake, and also, hopefully, making something meaningful, even if it's only meaningful to you. So, the next time you see one of those all too rare chances to be creative within a video game, I suggest you take it, because video games alone will never be able to capture the potential of your creative skills, meaning that it's your responsibility to capitalise on them and make something cool.
So, while there might not be that many games about making music, thanks to a little bit of lateral thinking, and the ability to share the things we've made, I think we've got things covered anyway. After all, who needs a proper music game when you can just make something like this, right? Oi oi oi, what do we have here? Well, if it isn't a random viewer who's still sticking around during the after the video segment. Welcome, welcome, no, you're not allowed to leave now, sorry, you're locked in, not much I can do about it. Anyway, now that you're here, this is the part of each and every video where I talk about some cool things that you should really check out that are much more important and worthwhile than whatever it is I make. This time, I really think you ought to turn your attention to the amazing Double Fine Psychodicy documentary which I just got done watching. Even if you're not interested in the Psychonauts games, which for the record you really should be, this is a one of a kind, incredibly thorough and incredibly candid look at just what goes into making an actual real life video game and I cannot recommend it highly enough. It's inspiring, emotional and educational all at the same time, and regardless of whether your interest in video games is professional or amateur, I can guarantee that you'll come away from it having learned something. Please do check it out. The other people I think you should check out are my patrons, who are looking extra handsome today if I do say so myself. Well, did you, did you all do something with your hair? No, it looks good, it looks very nice. Anyway, it's not just sycophantic compliments that my patrons enjoy, they also get a whole host of bonus stuff for helping to support the channel. They get early access to videos, they get bonus content in the form of an extra page or two of unused script for each video, they get behind the scenes channel updates, and they even get a hotline straight to me to answer whatever weird questions they might have about video games. This video needed a hell of a load of rewrites to do this very tricky topic justice, and if it weren't for my patrons backing me up, I would have felt the need to rush it out and end up with a worse product. But thanks to their support, I could take a few extra days to get it just right, which hopefully was worthwhile, and you all have them to thank. Of course, one other thing that my patrons get is a very special shout out, reserved for those illustrious widows who really think I'm worth $10 a month. Those people are Ali Wright, Andrew Lebrano, Asaran, Auno94, Bardic Dragoon, Brennan Spaulding, Brian Natariani, Constantin Amend, Cosmix360, Daniel Medjez, Das Kangaroo, David Setzer, Dirk Jan Karambeld, Digletier, Ecton, Edward Franklin Woods, Eugene Bulkin, Gazkull, IFR93, ISAW Dano, Jacob Dylan Riddle, Jinkloid, John Garley A, Justin Dent, Kevin Help Us, Lars Schaefer, Mace254, Manuki, Marika Vladelina Altair, whew, got that one first try, Mark Vallant, Max Filipov, Nate Graff, NWDD, Oliver Mahofer, Patrick Romberg, Peter D. Tomasak, Redadex, Regal Regex, Ray's Dad, Sean Mattox, Sheldon Hearn, Simon Jacobson, Steve Riley, Tin Markovic, Ty Guren, Tyler Duncan, Uprising, Whimsical Wisp, Zach Brantmeyer, and Chow. Well, that's me done. Thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next video. Bye.